Global food systems make up nearly one-third of human-made greenhouse gas emissions. That's according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. Florence Reed works with farmers in Central America to restore degraded farmland. I'm at Florence in New York City at the Clinton Global Initiative Gathering, which brings together global leaders to discuss the world's most pressing challenges. She is currently the founder of Sustainable Harvest International. I love your Genesis story, and I'm going to do like a thumbnail sketch and then maybe you can expand on it. Basically, it starts out with like a terrible boss, um, <laughs> but also a chance encounter with the Swiss tourist. And then suddenly you're off to the races and I've kind of set it up for you. <laughs> Tell the story because it's an amazing story. Um, sure. So I was working for another organization. This is what, 26, 27 years ago, trying to get some work done with them and was finding that, that my boss really wasn't going to let the work happen. And eventually he said, just raise the money. Don't worry how it gets spent. <laughs> I'll take care of that. <laughs> And I said, well, I can't do that. <laughs> so I'll send you my resignation letter this afternoon. And at that point, I had been down to Honduras. I had hired two people to start working with farmers there and helping them adopt agroforestry practices, integrating trees in with their agricultural crops. And so I felt very um, committed to, to them and responsible for uh, for having hired the the field trainers um, and for having told the farmers we'd be working with them. And I thought, well, now what am I gonna do now? And I didn't see a very realistic way for my 20 oh, something year old self to find the money and to find the skills and everything to start a whole new organization. So I said, all right, I'm gonna give myself one day and see if I can figure out a reasonable plan. And if I can't figure it out during that day, then I'll just face reality, get a job to pay the bills. My mother said if I liked warm weather and Spanish-speaking people, I could go and work at Disney World, <laughs> um, move to Florida <laughs> instead of working in Central America, where, where I'd been a Peace Corps volunteer. And that same day, I got an email, which was a brand new thing at the time, um, from a guy named Dieter in Switzerland, and I'd met him on my last trip down to Central America in Panama. He was there with some friends as a tourist. He emailed and said, what's happening? Has your crazy boss uh, <laughs> ruined everything yet? And I said, well, actually, I had to leave, um, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, well, open a bank account, and I'll wire you some money to start your new nonprofit tomorrow. And I thought, huh, well, worth a try. How much money could he have, though? He's about my age. And uh, the next day, there um, was uh, there were several th several thousand dollars uh, in that bank account, and it was enough to get started. I sent half of it to Honduras to keep the guys there going for the first few months, and I used the rest to print up letterhead and write to everybody I'd ever met in my life, asking for more donations. And then, little by little, it's been building from there, and um, I hope it's going to be growing a lot more in the coming years. Is, is it part of that? Is it the youth and I can get this done? I mean, what, what drives somebody, a young woman at that time, to, to take mm -hmm. that stab at it? Well, I just felt a profound responsibility uh, to the farmers, to the planet. I saw the possibility to make really significant positive change. And I'm just the sort of person who I still don't think that much about the obstacles. Uh, I've got the head in the clouds part. We've got others with the feet on the ground. And, uh, and it, it seems to have worked out. <laughs> Florence's childhood experiences led her to take an interest in environmental issues. She studied environmental conservation and international affairs at the University of New Hampshire. In 1997, she founded Sustainable Harvest International, an environmental nonprofit that partners with smallholder farmers on regenerative farming practices. You also said uh, farmers are our future, and most of us think of the type of farmers you're dealing with as the, the farmers of the past, and yet they are the farmers of the future, and ag can help us with our future. Can you talk to us about the importance of the work and how it does deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the, that, that really 
<laughs> bothers me when people seem to think that organic farming, um, uh, e ecological farming is something of the past. I mean, certainly there were a lot of these practices used in the past, but they're constantly evolving, they're being improved on, they're science-based, they're based in soil science, they're based in ecology, and the types of farming that Sustainable Harvest uh, promotes with, with the farmers and that the farmers adopt is rooted in, I, I boil it down to two basic principles. One is soil health. So building up healthy soils primarily through adding uh, organic carbon to the soil. So organic material, decomposed material, whether it's in the form of compost or whether it's in the form of decomposing cover crops, uh, whatever that may be. And then maintaining that healthy soil with a healthy, healthy ecosystem in the soil with all the microorganisms that help the crops to grow. And then the second piece is biodiversity. Um, when farmers begin working with us, usually they're growing two, three, four different crops. When they finish our four-year program, they're growing 20, 30, 40 different crops. Um, fruits, vegetables, uh, a variety of different trees, timber trees, fruit trees, hardwood trees, nut trees, spice trees. Uh, and all of these different crops work together to create a healthy ecosystem that to a great extent sustains itself, takes care of itself. Uh, so. Once it's established, it's less work for the farmers. Uh, there need to be few, if any, external inputs, so there's there's no costs like that, and it's not bringing toxic chemicals in, into the ecosystem either. You mentioned reversing climate change, and you mentioned in your talk there are 500 million small-scale farmers, and they could hold the key to fighting climate change. And you're talking about, uh, you know, there's this few anecdotal stories, but you add that uh, it, when it becomes 500 million stories, yes. it, it really can make a huge difference. Yes, if all 500 million of those smallholder farmers around the world made this transition, um, they could get us 53% of the way to the United Nations goal for greenhouse ga gas reductions, net reduction. So we still need to cut emissions and uh, uh, do all of those things. but. Farmers could take us so far, and they could do it in a way where nobody has to sacrifice anything, but instead they actually, it raises a standard of living for those people. Um, most of the world's hungry live in rural areas. They could be feeding themselves um, by reversing climate change, by adopting these practices. Um, and it's simply a matter of, of making that investment in the technical assistance. The world spends a tremendous amount on subsidizing agriculture that fuels climate change. If 5% of that was redirected to technical assistance like this, uh, we could instead be getting ourselves 53% of the way to a stable climate. Since the 1960s, global agricultural productivity has declined 21% due to climate change, especially in more vulnerable regions like Latin America. At the same time, unsustainable farming practices are damaging the environment and further contributing to climate change. Some of those practices include using toxic chemicals, raising forests for farmland, and growing the same crops over and over again, which depletes the soil. You gave a talk where you talked about a, a ride, and, and you kind of paint this mental picture of, of riding with your, your son. I felt like I was in the car with you as you described the terrain and kind of the issues out there. Can you yep. kind of recite a little bit of that for us? Um, yeah, it, it was one of, of m many such rides I've taken. It's usually in a pickup truck trying to get out to areas where we work in Central America. I, th I think the one I was describing there happened to be in Nicaragua, uh, but it, it could be in any of the countries where sustainable harvest works. And as you drive along, if it is the time of year when the farmers burn their fields, just on every side of you, it's black and it's burnt and you can smell the lingering smoke. And um, it, to me, it just, it feels like a hellscape. It feels like uh, you're riding through the valley of death. <laughs> and, um, and that's one example of it. Another is going through huge banana plantations where you can see them spraying toxic chemicals out of airplanes onto the workers and onto the food that will be eating and um, it it just breaks my heart to see humans uh, 
just through a lack of knowledge of a better way, choosing to use death as a way to grow our food rather than using all of the abundance of life that can work together to, to produce an abundance of healthy food for us. We're here at the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, which you clearly know. Um, <laughs> I was at one of the sessions yesterday, and they had two very dynamic women uh, on the stage, indigenous, talking about the struggles uh, in Central America, that <laughs> they have to deal with climate change. They're on the front lines of climate change. Yep. And, you, you know, you talked about this hellscape of seeing, you know, the burned <laughs> terrain. But give us the, the lay of the land and just how difficult it is and and with regards to indigenous people in Central America and, and some of the people you work with, just the struggles uh, to kind of do it the right way, as you just described it. In my experience, the primary struggle is technical assistance, getting long-term technical assistance, somebody to accompany them over multiple years while they make that transition to the sustainable <clears throat> regenerative uh, practices. It's not something that can be done overnight, not something that can be done with one workshop. Uh, it, it needs to be long term and it needs to be done in partnership with the farmers, with their families. So building on all of the knowledge that they already have starting there uh, and then creating the plans together for, for each farm and not coming in with a cookie cutter approach and saying, all right, you're going to grow this, this and this and you're going to do it this way. Um, but offering them a menu, here's all the practices that will benefit your family and the environment and the pluses and minuses, here's all the different crops. Each family then decides for themselves and then step by step put the pieces in place. And I, I feel like that's what's primarily missing. Um, and it, certainly there are other threats out there of outside forces coming in and buying the land. If the farmers can't get ahead, then there's a temptation to sell uh, the land. But if they have the adequate practices to provide a decent life for their families, I think almost all of them will want to stay on their land and farm it the, the what I consider to be the right way, the way that's uh, good for the for the planet. Um, and it's primarily the the technical assistance that's that's missing. Florence's program provides local farmers with technical education to bring a more sustainable agricultural food system to Central America. In addition to helping the environment, her program also aims to save 5 million people from poverty in Latin America by 2030. Describe the work, um, you know, you mentioned that it's, it's not something that, it, that can be cookie cutter, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, huh. um, it's gradual, yep. but you can measure progress. So okay. describe what you've seen over the years and, and kind of the milestones, and are there some stories along the way that resonate with you? Well, I, mean, I could say that um, at this point, we've worked with over 3,000 uh, family farms throughout Central America, Honduras, Panama, Belize, and Nicaragua. Um, and those farms, they've planted over 4 million trees as part of this integrated approach to farming. Uh, they've restored um, tens of thousands of acres of previously degraded lands. Um, and. I guess the the stories that stick with me, there's there's the people stories and then and there's the environment stories. So the people stories are you know, the stories of the mother uh, saying that her children are now eating a healthy meal uh, three times a day, which they weren't able to do before, and that her new baby she's able to breastfeed the baby because she's actually healthy enough herself because she's eating a healthy diet, um, or the mother saying that her mental health has improved because she's growing. Uh, healthy, plentiful food for her family right around the house on land that she thought would never uh, produce anything again. Um, or the mother was so proud about being able to send her child to high school and uh, showing me that she had, she was, the day she was graduating from our program, she had just bought a laptop, um, probably the first one in her village, um, because her daughter was going to be going um, to the bigger town to go to high school, and she didn't want her to be behind the, the kids from that bigger town. And um, and she was just so proud of achieving that through what she was growing and producing right around her house on land, again, that she thought would never produce anything. So those people's stories um, are, are so important to me. That's something I'm thinking about a lot. 
But it's a course correction, and a lot of people don't like change. I mean, how much how much difficulty you run into and try, just try to explain things and try to get people on board? Is it is it is it a hard sell it on occasion, or I mean, how would you describe it? Um, it's not really a hard sell. Uh, we start working when we start working in a community. Uh, our local staff will go in and they'll explain what we offer, uh, which is primarily technical assistance. What we don't offer, what the families can expect in terms of uh, work and putting the time and the effort uh, in, what they can expect from us. Uh, often when it's possible, we will bring a farmer with us who has already graduated from our program. And so I think that's very beneficial. That farmer can talk very clearly about what they had to put into it, but also what they're getting out of it, that now they're uh, growing over 90% of the food that they need for a healthy diet for themselves, how their income has improved, how they don't have to leave their family to go and work in the city or work on a big plantation where they get sprayed with those chemicals. Um, and when families hear that and hear that land that they thought couldn't produce anything can actually produce more than enough for a good life for their families. Uh, the majority of them are very happy to uh, make that leap of faith, um, knowing that we're going to be there with them every step of the way, every week or two uh, for four years until they, they're seeing the results, until they're comfortable continuing on their own. So let me ask the obvious question. You're, you're a young woman, but you were a much younger woman when you started this. Uh, so you're young, you're idealistic, you're a woman, um, you're a gringa. Uh -huh. uh, you don't have this, hey, I've got farmer Jose over here to bring in and show you how everything worked great for him. You've got to go and do this kind of on your own starting out at the beginning. Um, can, can you talk about some kind of the hardships uh, kind of building to where we are today? Uh, you know, what was it like those early, those early years? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I, mean, I, I got started in the Peace Corps, and um, so that was a wonderful learning experience uh, for me, having two years um, essentially trying to do this work myself. And I took away, I think, two key lessons from my Peace Corps experience. One was that farmers needed time to make this kind of change. It had to be a multi-year process. And then second, a gringo wasn't the best person to be helping them with this process, that a local person was going to be more effective. So from the very beginning, um, I had local people who were the ones that were working with the farmers, the first two guys hired in Honduras that I talked about. Um, and I was there supporting them, uh, working with them, collaboratively to, to guide uh, the organization. But it was definitely difficult because in the beginning we couldn't afford any transportation, so we would have to ride buses and, and, uh, then, and then hike for an hour. And, uh, and then little by little we built up and we got a motorcycle and then it was riding the motorcycle down the dirt roads. And I remember being I think eight months pregnant and being certain that, that I was going to lose the baby because the roads are so bad <laughs> going going down those roads and um, and just camping out uh, in a, a spare building in one of the communities and hearing that the military were coming in chasing gorillas through the gorillas, not the animals, but fighters <laughs> uh, through through the area that we should keep our door locked and and, and you know, just all, all, all these kind of things that you have to roll with and, and then just keep pushing forward, keep pushing forward uh, as, as the organization evolves. And <laughs> our common humanity is more important than our interesting differences. That cooperation reach conflict and inclusion is better than division. The Clinton Global Initiative has recognized Florence's program on sustainable farming in Central America. It's interesting, uh, Bill Clinton spoke uh, yesterday at this event and he said, um, you know, that, that there's a problem out there where people think it's it's the politicians and it's the policy people that make a difference. And okay. it's actually the people that make a difference. And and clearly there's a gathering of a lot of people, much like yourself, okay. who, uh, who take that stand, get yep. up one morning and say, you know, I'm going to help change the world. Um, yeah. It's not easy. Right. But uh, and it doesn't happen overnight, as, right. as you just explained. But talk to us about the rewarding aspect of, of the type of work that you do um, and that conscious effort to, to, you know, basically plant your flag in the ground and say, this is where I'm going to go. This is what we're going to do. 
Well, it's, um, like I said, every farm that I visit, <laughs> it's tremendously rewarding to uh, see it coming back to life. And I guess maybe the most rewarding is going back to farms five or 10 years after they've finished our program. Um, the last time I was down in Panama, um, I visited a farmer who had graduated 10 years previously. Um, and his farm just looks like paradise uh, to me. I, I know he's still working really hard and it's not as much of a paradise when you're the one doing all the hard work, but, uh, but, but he's, he's also clearly thrilled with what he's created for his family where they're producing all their food. Um, he, he showed me, um, he lives in a fairly low elevation where as far as I knew, strawberries were not supposed to grow. In Panama, I always was told you could only grow them at the very highest elevations. He was growing strawberries somehow, and I attribute it to this really healthy ecosystem that he's created. Um, and he was really proud uh, about the fact that the government had come through and done a health survey. And uh, his family was about the healthiest in the community, and not because of any medicines, like everybody else was having to buy medicines and vitamins and this and that. Um, he said that his family was healthy because they're growing all their own food and they're growing healthy diversity of food for a good balanced diet without any toxic chemicals. And uh, he, he attributes it to the, the way that they've been farming for the past 10 years, and it's just been getting better and better every year. One final question, uh, I guess, Part of your story is the transition from gorillas with machine guns to monkeys actually swinging through the trees that you never <laughs> expected to see. And um, and there's people probably watching this saying, you know, I want to make a difference I, like mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. What would your advice be to somebody who perhaps is young, idealistic, watching this program who thinks, you know, maybe I can go out and make a difference? Yeah, I think everybody can just look around them and see something that uh, could be better in in our world and and then just go for it and I know it's you know easier for some of us um, than for others I you know I came from a background where um, I knew that I had a family to fall back on that would take care of me if I was broke and <laughs> not everybody has that I didn't have any student debt so that was helpful um, but I think everybody can make a difference um, whether it's starting a, a, a new nonprofit, starting a new initiative, to just thinking about what food you're buying, how it's grown, um, thinking about the farmers that are producing it. Uh, every single thing that we, we buy, and especially food, I think, is gonna have an impact on, on our own being and on, on the health of our planet. So I think that's something that everybody uh, can really easily do. And, and I know people say, oh, if it's uh, organic or something, it costs more money, but people all the time spend more money to buy a better pair of shoes, a better purse, a better this, a better that. And I can't think of anything more important to spend a little extra on than, than good food that we put into our bodies and, and that we take from the earth. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you.